carnival usually brings a stop to the Brazilian political news cycle, with Congress taking a break and pretty much no one staying in the capital city of Brasilia. But under Jair Bolsonaro, carnival has been quite an eventful holiday for political news. In 2019, he made a now infamous tweet about golden showers, sparking outrage on social media. And you know it has been a weird, weird week when the leader of 209 million people is asking Twitter a question you'd expect Gail King to be asking R. Kelly. But this year, the president outdid himself by sharing a video on WhatsApp inviting his supporters to join a protest on March 15. Among the demands of these demonstrations is the complete shutdown of Congress and the Supreme Court, institutions which Bolsonaro's allies accuse of trying to reduce the president's power to carry out his agenda. Congress leaders have called out Jair Bolsonaro in unison, and some opponents are even talking about impeachment. At the very least, this new controversy could hamper the agenda of reforms in 2020. If it was to go ahead, however, Brazil could be diving headfirst into an unpredictable political crisis. My name is Gustavo Ribeiro, I'm the editor-in-chief of the Brazilian Report. This is Explaining Brazil. Since Bolsonaro shared this call of arms, so to speak, impeachment talks begin being openly held in Brasilia corridors. So before talking about whether or not Jair Bolsonaro could be ousted, we need to understand how impeachment work in Brazil and whether or not the president committed an impeachable offense. To help us understand this issue, we have with us political scientist Fernando Bizarro, a PhD researcher at Harvard's Department of Government. Fernando, thanks for joining us. Brazil's institutions are at times inspired by French institutions, while others were molded after the U.S. So could you explain to us exactly how the process of impeachment works in Brazil? The impeachment comes to the Brazilian legal framework uh, together with presidentialism, right? And there are those come from the inspiration that early state makers in Brazil we were seeking into the American experience when they were trying to create this new country uh, that was in, in 1889, there was not something that would be a monarchy anymore, right? The Brazil had gotten rid of its monarchy with the proclamation of the Republic. And the model by that time, and it's still pretty much the model, the model through which you could govern a country without a king was with, uh, with a president. And so when it Brazilian state makers go find inspiration for this model in the United States. They find the model that has impeachment as the mechanism through which the legislature may remove the president under some specific circumstances, right? So even though you were right, that there are many other dimensions of Brazilian legal framework that are inspired by the European continental experience, the, the political institutions are modeled very strongly, but in particular the ones associated with presidentialism after the American experience, because that's where Latin America in general, not only Brazil, went after for inspiration when trying to design a system to govern these countries, who would, which would no longer have kings. We just had an impeachment trial in the U.S., and the American media spent a lot of time trying to explain what are quote, high cries and misdemeanors, which is a very vague concept. We in Brazil also have a highly subjective idea as to what qualifies as an impeachable offense, uh, the so-called crime de responsabilidade. This literally translates as a crime of responsibility, which you could perhaps translate as something like crimes against the public administration. Would you say that is accurate? I think that is a good translation. It is a, a, a little bit broader than just crimes against the administration. It, they also involve the behavior of the president, right? Like if the president is not behaving in ways that are in accordance with what you would expect an honored man to behave, uh, so you might impeach the president for that. So that is kind of is a is a is a broad category that is broad by design as much as crimes and misdemeanors because. 
the the president can you can't typify everything that's criminal in this um act to, in this in this uh legislation because if you do you also leave lots of things out right and presidents and politicians in general are very creative in how they do things wrong so if the president does something that was not in the law the the Congress could be could have its hands tied because it could not impeach the president, even though the president had done something that everyone would agree that was wrong, right? So legislators seem on purpose create a, a category that's vague enough for Congress or for whoever is 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 uh, putting the president on trial to evaluate whether whatever the president did is something that's so serious that deserves to that that the, the, the uh, for which the president deserves to be impeached, right? And this is, uh, uh, again, a, a part of the design that the American uh, institution builders had and that Brazil imported. You need to design a system that is that classifies what would be the general set of things that the president can do, leaving it vague enough so that Congress can connect things that the president does and the the Congress could not anticipate which they would be to these vague categories in order to punish the president when it's necessary. So based on that definition, we could say that every president elected in democratic times could realistically have been impeached if Congress wanted to do it. I mean, half of Bolsonaro's predecessors in post-dictatorship Brazil were impeached. When Congress impeaches the president, Congress is saying, look, public, you voted this person in, but this person has done something that is unacceptable. So we are going to remove this person that you voted for and who you selected to be president. So because the people have also voted for the president, punishing the president is something very, very serious in the minds of legislators because they are, in, in a way, also going against the will of the people, the same people who have elected the legislators. So it is established in the literature that in order for you to actually have an impeachment and to see that happening in Latin America recently, just having the president committing a crime is not enough. You need to have a crime, you need to have or a crime or something that Congress would consider it to be a crime. You need to have massive popular dissatisfaction, which is usually associated with a massive economic crisis. And this abstraction is to be clearly expressed. So it's not enough to have a few um, uh, uh, opinion polls that shows that the president's um, the president's popularity is low. It need there people need usually need to be on the street, clearly demonstrating that they are upset with that president. When Congress receives this message that the president is no longer working well in terms of producing economic growth, keeping the country in stability, so much so that the people are on the streets protesting to remove that president, that is when. Congress takes the cue and says, okay, now we go on and now we remove this president. As we saw in 2015 and 2016, right? Correct. And as you saw with Collar as well, right? Like you were, and, and as you did not see with Timmer right after, because you remember Timmer was a very unpopular president. And nevertheless, he, wasn't, he was not removed. Coming back to 2020, uh, in your opinion, has Jair Bolsonaro committed an impeachable offense by sharing this video? calling people to the streets for anti-Congress protests? Yes, absolutely. And, and that is actually a very interesting thing because while the set of the definitions of what is uh, a behavior that is unacceptable and that would be subject to impeachment is vague, for example, in the Dilma case, it was crimes against the public budget, which is a very, very broad thing, um, and that was the, 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 the definition under which the pedaladas disguise were, were connected to. Um, Bolsonaro's action, the, it is explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, right? The president, and no, neither, no power can attack, the, the, and attack and prevent the well functioning of the other powers, right? Bolsonaro deliberately did exactly that. This is so unambiguously bad that it's actually written in the Constitution that the president can't do it. So uh, I think it is undeniable that, that Bolsonaro did something that if Congress wanted to impeach him, Congress would have the tools to impeach him. 
differently from the the case with Dilma, in which there, there the Congress had to make this connection that Pedalada Swiss guys were actually a type of crime against the budget. There was something that was in the Constitution, so there were kind of a few steps. Bolsonaro's impeachment request could probably be like a paragraph long and say the president did this and it is very clearly said here in the constitution that it's unacceptable. Um, so it, it, he definitely did something that if Congress wanted, he could be removed. And it's also important to say that it is just not the first time he did that, right? Like there is a sequence of behaviors in which the, the behavior of the president could be considered not honored or not in line with what you would expect an honorable president to do. So Bolsonaro is giving enough tools to Congress to remove him if Congress wants to remove him. So, Fernando, you're mentioning Article 85 of the Constitution, which prevents any branch of the federal government from interfering with another. But Bolsonaro's supporters evoke Article 5, which guarantees freedom of speech. How does one wait against the other? The president should be able to say, look, I am trying to do this, and Congress is blocking me. So the president does have freedom to do this. What the president does not have the freedom, and in fact, no one could can do, is say, well, we should do something to to call, close Congress or stop Congress or give put an end to the to Congress's ability to check the president. This is not freedom of speech per se, because it's not the president making a case. It's actually the president attempting against the well-functioning and the structure of the Brazilian Republic. That is much more serious than just saying, well, I'm trying to do something and these guys are preventing me from doing it. It is a much more serious thing because it's actually suggesting actions to the public that will break the structure of the Republic, right? It will break the structure that the Constitution predicts to be the structure by which Brazil is governed. So this is a much more serious thing that is not uh, protected by freedom of speech because it goes against the very own structure that also guarantees freedom of speech. And I bet you that if Congress wanted to impeach the president, it would just it would not think for five seconds about this argument. It would just not buy it. After the break, why Congress is unlikely to go straight into a direct confrontation with Jair Bolsonaro. I'm Gustavo Ribeiro, and you're listening to Explaining Brazil. You may have seen in the news that Jeff Bezos, simply the world's richest man, was hacked. That shows you that nobody and no company is totally immune from cyber criminals. But with fast help, you can protect your company's virtual space. FastHelp is a Brasilia-based IT company that offers the best tools against hacking and data breaches. Go to fasthelp.com.br for more information. fasthelp.com.br Ewan Marshall, hello. Hi, Gustavo. Ewan, we've just heard from Fernando Bizarro about the fact that Congress is not willing to impeach Jair Bolsonaro at least not now. Why is that in your opinion? Well, the thing is that an impeachment is a long and painful process. It can only really happen if you have this sort of perfect storm against a president. That usually means massive unpopularity, an economic crisis, and a political crisis coming at the same time. Although, you know, often one does usually feed the other. Yeah, and to your point, those conditions are particularly important in a political system as fragmented as Brazil's. Yet, yeah, and in Bolsonaro's case, we only have one of these components, which is the constant political bickering that we have between the president and Congress. But while Bolsonaro is unpopular under normal terms, he has a consistent support base of about 30 to 35 percent of voters. For means of comparison, when Dilma Rousseff was impeached, her approval ratings were down at 10 percent. But, you know, there's a bigger issue at play in this example. Which is... Well, Jair Bolsonaro is currently leading the most militarized administration in democratic Brazilian history. A recent survey by a newspaper, Folhas de São Paulo, showed that there are at least 2,500 military officers in senior positions within the federal government. And the president recently reshuffled his cabinet, making it so that his core group of ministers, who are the ones that operate out of the presidential palace, 
Now they are all members of the armed forces. And these ministers are usually the ones who are the president's most trusted advisors. And now they are all military men. Mm-hmm. And the president is flanked by retired generals that have already defended our military intervention as recently as 2017. One of the examples being his vice president, Amuto Moron. Military intervention is, of course, a dog whistle term for coup d'etat. Yeah, exactly. So you're essentially saying that Congress is almost held hostage to the military presence in the administration. Yeah, in a sense, I mean, you know, political elites in Brazil will have that possibility in the back of their minds. I'm, I'm not saying that it will happen, but, you know, it could happen. So will the president simply get a pass? Well, not necessarily, because we have some parties that are trying to use the president's sons to punish him. We have Congressman Eduardo Bolsonaro, who is Jair's third eldest son. He has two cases against him in the House's Ethics Committee for arguing that his father should employ the same strategies as the military dictatorship if, quote, the left radicalizes. And, you know, as we know, these strategies included political persecution, arbitrary arrests, and, you know, even torture. Okay. So they could pass some sort of sanction against Eduardo, maybe like a suspension or a reprimand, something to try and draw a red line without triggering a bigger reaction from the president and his military allies. And how about economic elites? Because they were pivotal actors in the impeachment of Dilma Rousseff, but they have been strong supporters of economy minister Paulo Guedes and his agenda of reforms. Of course, we know from the 2016 experience that as soon as the impeachment process is launched, the government just goes into a halt and nothing gets done. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, back in 2016, the Sao Paulo Federation of Industries, it's called FIESP, they actually worked against the president. But now the head of FIESP is about to get a cushy job as the treasurer of Jair Bolsonaro's new political party in Sao Paulo. And, you know, we haven't seen any major industrialists coming forward against the president either. And while those industrialists have been quiet, uh, Brazil's major newspapers have pushed back at the president. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Folha de Sao Paulo, which is the, the leading newspaper in the country, they said that a fear of impeachment might be the only thing that could hold Jair Bolsonaro back. But their message was more along the lines of kind of asking Congress to step up to the plate rather than actually asking for Jair Bolsonaro to be ousted. And you and those who followed the Brazilian report know that this past year has been marked by a pull and push relationship between Bolsonaro and Congress. Those who are not familiar with that dynamics, uh, you can go to Brazilian.report and download a, an ebook we wrote about uh, Jair Bolsonaro's first year in office. So uh, almost on a weekly basis, democratic institutions are being tested. And so far, they seem to have endured with flying colors, some experts would say. Uh, will that continue? Well, a consistent strategy of this Bolsonaro government has been to kind of test the democratic waters as often as they can to see how far the president can go before he is curtailed. The problem with that is that, you know, every attack on democracy seems to push the red line back a little bit further. I mean, we couldn't imagine former presidents getting away with half of the things that this current administration has done in a little over a year. So the risk is that he may get progressively more and more powerful over Congress and create an imbalance of power, which would be dangerous regardless of who the president was, let alone someone openly anti-democratic as Bolsonaro. And both on the left and the right, what is interesting is that a lot of people dismiss what Bolsonaro is doing by just saying he's clueless and that he has no method. But the more and more we see about him, uh, it looks like there there is method to the madness. Yeah, and but we also can't make the mistake to suggest that it can't be craziness and strategic at the same time. <laughs> and so uh, on March 15th, when the anti-Congress demonstrations are set to take place, it will show us whether or not Bolsonaro will put enough people on the street to corner the other branches of government or if he will be left exposed. Yeah, it seems so. Last year, the government pulled a similar move, right? Yeah, that's right. And Bolsonaro was able to put some people on the streets, just maybe not enough for it to be a total flop, but not nearly enough to make him more powerful than he already was. And that's, that's likely to be the case this time around. I mean, Bolsonaro has support, but not majority support. 
And it might also be worth mentioning the the kind of the coronavirus risk at the moment, because if this spread gets any worse, public gatherings like, you know, street protests, they'll become frowned upon, meaning that it could be either a genuine deterrent for protesters or it might actually work as a convenient excuse for a street demonstration that was, you know, a little bit of a flop. So it seems that the standstill is likely to continue. Yes. And that's bad news for the reform agenda in Congress, right? Most likely, yes. This podcast was written and sound engineered by me, Gustavo Ribeiro. Ewan Marshall edits the final script and Lucas Berti produced this show. If you like this podcast, rate us on any platform you may be listening to Explain in Brazil. It is really important for us because it helps other people find about this show. But the best way to support Explain in Brazil is to subscribe to the Brazilian Report, the journalistic engine behind this podcast. Every day we have new content about Brazilian politics, finance, and society. We've also got exclusive newsletter services if you want to be briefed about what's going on in Brazil before starting your day. Subscribe now for our free trial and take a look at our content for seven days. And it is really free. You don't have to submit any credit card information whatsoever. Just go to brazilian.report slash subscribe. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter or handle us at Brazilian Report. That's all for now. See you next week.